Hello baseball fans and welcome into another edition of the British Baseball Podcast. I'm your host Matthew and before we delve into part two of the Will Linton interview, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your uh, continued support and if you've got any suggestions for the show or you'd like to share a story, please contact me on the email britishbaseballpodcast at gmail.com or if you aren't following me already on the uh, social medias, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BritBaseballPod. And we've also now got a YouTube channel, uh, which is British Baseball Podcast. If you want to like, share and subscribe on there, there'll be more content added as and when it comes on. Now, without further delay, let's get into the show. Uh, I've been asked by a lot of the listeners as well. Um, if you could talk about the fundamentals of pitching and catching. In particular, um, I was going to ask one of the listener questions before from Lucy Chapman, who plays for the Kent Mariners. Uh, Lucy's interested in trying out pitching and catching, but she's never really done it before, and she wants to know, are there any tips for, for starting out? So, um, like, are there any sort of useful skills to have to sort of take into the game? Like, for example, uh, I'm six foot three, about 60 and a half stone, um, what would I sort of need to to sort of work on? I, I mean, I know I'm like I'm I'm almost forty, but like if if there's like uh, Lucy's um, uh, teen, so is there anything like you can give advice on people that are new to it? And then also I've got guys that are like like me that are trying out for for local teams that have just had a handful of training sessions. What what sort of things are useful to have around in our in our arsenal if we're going to try out pitching and catching? Absolutely. Well, first off, uh, thank you, Lucy. That's an awesome question. And I always love to hear about um, people trying both positions for the first time. Um, let's break them down. Let's, let's cover pitching first and then catching. So I would say if you're going to try pitching for the first time, number one is try not to overthink it. Um, pitching is throwing um, and, and throwing is pitching. Like it's there are some things that we do differently and it looks funky because there's a leg lift um, and the reason the leg lift is there is because you can't take a step, you can't have a run up, you've got to start from a, uh, um, a, 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 a stop, so to speak. But other than that, it's essentially throwing. Where it gets tricky is we need to have good timing. And what I mean by timing is we want our hands and our feet working together. Um, not necessarily doing the same thing all the time, but just our hands and feet working together. So, well, how do we, we then translate that to um, someone who's trying pitching for the first time. And I'll just come back to my first point, which is don't overthink about it and certainly don't worry about getting it right. Um, I would say just try and throw as hard as you can and try to hit the glove. I think one of the mistakes I see new pitchers doing is trying to be too focused on throwing the perfect strike. Um, throw it as hard as you can, throw it down the middle of the plate and see what happens. And the reason I say that is I think in general, we as humans are better at hitting a target when we just throw it hard and don't try to aim it. Um, think about the number of times that we try a new skill or a sport like golf or darts and we've got no idea what's going on and we just have a go and, oh, we, we you know hit a bullseye or, or we put a ball. And then we get ahead of ourselves and take a few lessons and start overthinking it and all of a sudden now we're getting angry because we didn't have that beginner's luck. And I think part of it is embracing beginner's luck. So just throw it hard and try to hit the glove right down the middle of the plate. And the middle of the plate is a great place to start um, because statistics show us hitters are going to get themselves out anyway. Um, so let them swing through it, let them put the ball in play, and let your fielders feel behind you. That would probably be um, my number one or, or, or first couple tips for pitching uh, fundamentals for a first timer. Um, catching is just a little bit more complicated, but not that much. And really, because with catching, it's important to be safe. Um, and there are two parts to being safe as a catcher. Number one is make sure you have the right equipment. So that includes leg guards, chest plate, uh, face mask and the right glove. Um, and then also a protective cup of some sorts. You know, you don't really don't want um, to get hit with a ball off the bat or a ball bouncing on the ground and it, and it's, and it get you between the legs. So make sure you, you're, you're protected and you're safe. Um, I don't have a contract or an endorsement with all-star catching gear, but I have to say um, that theirs is by far and away the best. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend my money on anything other than, than all-star, especially their leg guards. So, so that's the first part of being safe. The second part of being safe is when you get down into a squat, 
we need to make sure um, that uh, the heels are down. And we can get into the details of one knee catching in a little bit, but the most important thing is you want your heels down. And the reason we want the heels down is uh, for the most part, simple anatomy. If your heels are down, you are engaging your glutes, uh, which are two of the strongest muscles in the body, and that makes sure the hips are in the right place. If your heels are up and you're on your toes, the weight shift forwards onto your knees and your quads, and that just leads to fatigue a lot earlier and the potential risk of injury. So those are my main, main points with, with catching is be safe. And then when you actually start trying the skill, um, be brave. You know, it's, you know, you, you, you got to have courage to get out there, but recognize the ball's going to hit you, whether because it, it bounces on the floor, it gets off the bat, you're going to get knocked around a little bit. So as long as you know that's going to happen, um, you don't have to like it. I hated it. You know, who who likes getting hit by a foul ball? Um, and I remember um, when I was playing in Menlo, I got hit in the wrist from balls in the dirt so often that I had a bone growth on my um, on my arm. And I'm not suggesting to any of our first time catchers that that's going to happen to you because that took four years of repeatedly uh, getting hit for that to happen. But I just want to be clear, like, don't be scared of the ball, um, but recognize it's going to hurt. But uh, as a coach, um, one of my mentors used to say, uh, it only hurts till the pain goes away. Um, and that's probably what I would say catching wise. Yeah, fair comment. Uh, does it help being a bit bonkers in it? I mean, I, when I was playing ice hockey, all the guys that wanted to be goaltenders seemed to um, have a look in your eye that you, you probably wouldn't want to meet, meet them in, in a dark alley. I think, yes, I think that helps. I think there's a special... Um, camaraderie among all catchers in the world because you basically said what we need someone to do is throw on some pieces of plastic and a little bit of metal go stand behind that guy who's got a bat and catch a ball that's being thrown upwards of 90 miles an hour and it might hit the ground or hit the bat and hit you in the face or the arm um, but don't worry about it you'll be fine um, and we'll very rarely give you praise we'll mostly talk about the pitcher and the shortstop or the center fielder who home run um, so, yes, I think being a little bonkers probably helps. Um, but really, I think it's also if you're the type of person that likes to um, have a little bit of control and support of your team, if you have a strong voice and you're willing to to pick your teammates up when they're down and you're happy to lead from the front, then that that's the right position for you. Then, yeah, of course, there are some mechanical and skill things that we need, would need to work on in terms of making sure you catch the ball well and you want to block it so it doesn't roll back to the backstop and then certainly throwing runners out are important but I think having the courage for a first-time catcher to get out there um, then not be scared of the ball but also having the desire to, to be a leader and, and wanting to help and support your teammates I think those are probably the most important things. Thank you very much. Um, let's go on to some listener questions, if we can. Um, what is your relationship with baseball and what kind of adventures and experiences has baseball given you? I think the relationship with my baseball, or with, with baseball rather, um, I would depend on whether or not my wife is going to listen to this uh, podcast. <laughs> it would depend whether or not I would say it's my first or second wife. Um, I... I've known baseball for, um, I think, all my life. I was very fortunate. I, I grew up in California. I didn't move to England until I was nine. Um, and I've been involved with the national team uh, since I was 14 or, yeah, 14. I first went to my, my first practice as a, as a player. And I, so I think it's to the point where if uh, when I, you know, if I get cut open, you see, you know, the red, white, and blue of GB baseball is probably what's running through my veins. Um, and it's, it's been, it has been there for as long as I can remember. And, and it's, it's without a doubt, you know, other outside of spending time with my, my wife, and I should say this cause she's probably listening, um, but also my children, it's, it's probably the thing uh, that I enjoy most. Um, as far as adventures, I mean, it's, it's taken me to some pretty incredible places. We've already mentioned Menlo, but getting to play, you know, three, four years of baseball as a kid in California and then go back. And it's just purely coincidental ending up at a, at a university that was three miles down the road from from where my old house was and getting to play there for another four years in Southern California. 
just the idea of going out and playing baseball every day in weather that's fantastic, I think is alien to, to a lot of people that, that play baseball in this country. And, and that was a wonderful experience. Um, in 1996, I got to go to Japan um, for the World Children's Baseball Fair. Uh, I was 11 at the time, and that was that was an experience. I mean, getting on a plane and flying to the other side of the world and, and going to a country where baseball really is a religion and being part of this amazing experience is something that I'll, that I'll always remember and, and I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity. Uh, and then 2009, um, going to the World Cup, I got to play for Great Britain in the World Cup and I distinctly remember when we got through to the next round and played against Cuba, who at the time were the the team. Um, the, the Japan were obviously good and, and the US were good as well, but Cuba were always the team to beat. And I went back and looked back at the roster recently and realized that in that game, Ioana Cespedes was playing center field and Yuli Gurriel uh, was one of the infielders in that tournament. So it's kind of cool to, to look back and, and know that I was playing, I was on the same field as some, some future, uh, some big time players uh, over, in, over in the States. Um, those are probably the highlights. I mean, and then even close to home, like my, my family, I'm very fortunate, I'm very supportive and love, love baseball. I, I proposed to my wife at the last World Baseball Classic qualifier in, in Brooklyn. Um, and we got to see Great Britain base, uh, GB beat Brazil in the, in the semi-final on the, on the day that, that we uh, got engaged. That was pretty fantastic. So, I mean, yeah. And then just round, round the country, you know, going, going from Tunbridge to Cartmel to Hull. Uh, I've seen parts of this country that, that some people haven't simply because of baseball. Um, and I'll be, yeah, I will be forever grateful for the experiences that, that uh that that's given me yeah it's a lovely story thank you um cam i think he might know you because yeah. this is a bit um a bit direct to be a random question is asked what's your favorite swedish snack so cam and i were well, cam was one of my assistant coaches with the u18s last year um and the tournament was in sweden and one of our other assistant coaches was swedish he introduced me to uh pom fritz which i mean <laughs> is is french but they you know swedish snack which is essentially um, potato crisps or chips for any North American listeners that are cut like French fries, baked quite hard and salted to within an inch of their life. And they were the things that got me through uh, the the late night um, planning and review sessions. I mean, and, that, and that's the thing that, that people don't always recognize is when we go on these tournaments, you know, we see the players and we know the games and, and we know the commitment there. Uh, but the coaches are often working till uh, the early hours of the morning, planning out and preparing, uh, sending reports back to maybe it might be Liam because he needs to know something or preparing reports for our, our players the next day. So, yes, thank you, Cam, for reminding me. But now everyone knows that my my guilty pleasure of what I need, the fuel to keep those those late night meetings going are uh, heavily salted pom frits from um, you asked Ian, uh, Ian Bleas was my guest last week, uh, yeah. the Liverpool Trojans GM. You asked him a great question about how Liverpool Trojans can, can sort of like take the, the sort of go forward with British baseball. Yeah. Uh, Ian's actually come back with a, a question of his own, uh, which is as deep and meaningful. He says, you got any advice about beard care? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't surprise me that that was Ian's response. Um, uh, I don't know. Use a good shampoo and depending on the length for me, uh, oil, because uh, sometimes your skin can get a little dry. Um, and uh, again, another shout out to my wife. Don't fiddle with it too much. Then it grows at different ang different angles is what she's always telling me. But yeah, uh, good beard shampoo, good beard oil um, and uh, and grow it the length that you that, that that suits you. I would say that that that's probably that's probably my three tips. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a beard uh, grower myself, and for those that are listening, I, I've got this on a video conference, and I can I can confirm that that Odin would be proud of <laughs> of, of Will's beard. It, it is a glorious beard. Um, Ian actually also uh, said another question as well. He said, "What do you think is behind the one knee catching revolution?" Mm, that's a great question. Ian and I have been talking about this quite a bit the last the last couple of weeks actually. Um, fundamentally, it comes down to a, a, a level of clarity that's come down from Major League Baseball um, as to what the most important skill for 
catches to have is. And, and typically, the big three skills were uh, receiving, um, which so anyone who isn't familiar, we, we refer to receiving rather than catching because catching would just be catching the ball, whereas receiving is doing what you can to either catch any ball because maybe the pitcher hasn't been accurate, but also presenting the ball back to the umpire to 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 increase the probability of, of getting a strike. Um, so receiving, blocking, throwing, um, and then you have the other skills. Obviously hitting is a big one, especially if someone needs their, their catcher to hit. And obviously the Yankees seem to care more about their catcher hitting than, than, than the other stuff, but we'll see if that changes. Um, and, and leadership it would be the fifth skill. So over the years, people would often think that throwing was the most important skill and even hitting. Like if we need a catcher that can throw and they can hit. They can drive runs in and um, they can throw runners out. But what's happened is because of the the big data movement that we're living in is some forward thinking clubs, particularly the Dodgers, uh, the Twins, the Rays, uh, the Astros, um, um, and even the Yankees themselves have all kind of realized that actually what, what we really need is to save runs. And how can we save runs? Because there are some positions that can score runs, but really we need to save runs. And what they've realized is the ability for a catcher to win strikes particularly borderline pitches in, in, in high leverage counts, like 0-2, 1-2, or, or even a hitter's count, drastically increases the probability of them saving runs and therefore winning runs, uh, winning games, excuse me. Um, and there was uh, a metric that I'm trying to remember, but it's something along the lines of the best catcher in the game um, who, uh, from, a, from a receiving standpoint, we're talking about JT Real Moto, Austin Barnes, they were capable of saving um, something like one and a half runs a game, which over the course of the season resulted in 10 wins. And that 10 wins is worth something like 23 to $25 million. So once teams realized that there was a, a figure in a dollar figure that they could apply to receiving, receiving became the most important skill. Once they realized that receiving is the most important skill, it's like, well, how can we make our catchers receive, receive better? And what they discovered was for most, and this is not, not true for everybody, but for most catchers, when you drop a knee, left or right, you two things happen. You relieve the stress on the legs, but you also get a greater range of motion from the arm, and you're able to become uh, a better and more able receiver. Then, you get more stability, so your head's moving less, so the umpire's view isn't as impeded, or rather the umpire doesn't see the catcher jumping or moving, which might indicate the ball was out of the zone. So you take all of these things, and ultimately it then becomes um, about trying to receive the ball better. Um, and I'm a big believer, I've, I've seen it with some of our own catchers, um, that they have, you know, overnight, become better receivers by going on one knee. I've got one young catcher I'm working with at the moment who still prefers a traditional stance, but by practicing on one knee, he's been able to better learn how his hand and glove need to work so that when he then goes back to his traditional stance, he now has a better better glove than he had been from a year of, of previous practice just using the, the, the old school um, kind of traditional stance where you're up on both feet. So that's, that's where it is. That's where it comes from. It comes from receiving. Um, and whilst we're not dealing with major league pitchers or, or major league catchers, uh, I'm a big believer that the British game would benefit um, from a one knee stance. Uh, and my reasons for it are, I think A, will be better at receiving, so therefore we'll get more strikes. I think we'll be better at blocking because uh, blocking is a really tricky skill, but the worst one is always the one that goes through the catcher's legs. So if our catchers are in a uh, lower position already, chances of them blocking increase, at least for that ball that's straight. Um, and then for throwing, if they're down on their right knee or their back knee, if they're a left-handed catcher, they put themselves in a better position to throw to second base because I, one of the problems I see from new catchers is they end up thinking, oh, wow, 120 feet is quite a long way. I'd better take a runner. But what we forget is every step we take as catchers, the base runner is taking maybe five, six, maybe sometimes even seven steps. So we've got to reduce the number of steps we take. So putting them in that one knee stance helps teach them that correct footwork. So for me, uh, whether it's left knee or right knee, it's it's a win-win all round um, with the caveat that 
some catchers are still going to prefer and will be better at a traditional stance, and, and, and that's perfectly fine too. Great stuff. Well, lovely answer. Thank you for that. Um, Jim has asked, uh, what would be your pitch to get somebody involved in the game? And I suppose this comes back to something we're trying to to off air as well, like um, how how can we kind of dispel myths surrounding baseball mm-hmm. with people thinking it's just American cricket and, and grown-up rounders? So I've gone back and forth with rounders over the years. I remember being in school and feeling like I, yeah, feeling like people would make fun of the fact I played baseball because it's just rounders. I remember coming back from the States and getting really grumpy with, you know, oh, it's just rounders and, and you, know, you know, what are you doing? That type of mentality. I've actually gone the other way. I'm now fully embracing the rounders mentality because if you ask people, did they enjoy rounders as a kid? Almost all of them say, yeah, they loved it. Problem with rounders is it's not available as an adult sport, particularly not for men. So my pitch now is, did you enjoy rounders? Yeah, I did. Great. Come play baseball because it's grown up rounders. Like we, we hit the ball further. We have a bigger bat. We also have gloves and we throw it harder. If you enjoyed rounders as a kid, you're going to love baseball. And if you didn't love rounders, well, go play football or something else. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of my pitch now is, is if you loved rounders as a kid, then get involved because you're really going to enjoy it. Um, now, if we talk about how do I pitch it to young people or, or, or families with kids, then that becomes much more about, I genuinely think it's one of the most democratic sports out there for learning. And what I mean by that is if you play football in a playground or at a park, it's always the big kid that gets past the ball and scores the goal. If you play basketball, it's always the tall kid that's past the ball so he can score or she can score. Um, if you're playing rugby, no one, unless you're really good at it and you really love rugby, no one really wants to go tackle the biggest kid on the on the team because it's just not that much fun. Um, as much as I love rugby, the reality is, you know, you know, who wants to tackle the six foot six guy who's already playing county level? Um, with baseball, though, when it's your turn, no one comes up and takes the bat out of your hands. When it's the balls hit at you, people don't run in front of you, barge you out the way field the ball and then make the play on your behalf. So there's that amazing opportunity that even though you're in a team and you get to uh, interact with teammates and depend on one another and that develop that camaraderie that comes from a team sport, it's still an individual sport and you get that opportunity and that moment to shine or, or to not and, and, and to struggle. And, but you get to come back and you get to try again. Um, and from a kid's perspective, um, As much as I love cricket, and I'm a huge fan of cricket, and I do a lot of work in cricket, I think cricket, especially at the younger age group, still struggles with if you're out on the first ball and they're only playing one innings, that's it, it's over. Whereas in baseball, you can strike out two times, but if you're playing more than two or three innings, chances are you're going to get another at-bat. You might get three, four, five at-bats in a day. And I think that's such a wonderful opportunity for young people to learn a game. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for anyone to come into a game knowing that it's okay to fail because you're going to get another chance and no one's going to come all along and take that bat out of your hands. So th- those are my those are my two pitches. One that's, I suppose, a little bit tongue-in-cheek um, and one that's that's a little bit more serious and, 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 and more thoughtful. Great answer. Great answer. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's pretty much it for the listener questions. So it's just a few uh, left from me. If we can, um, I sort of, away from, from baseball and sport, you, you're into your music. Um, we've been talking about uh, heavy metal being a, a love of yours and um, what was it that happened at the BSUK uh, summit the other week you had a, a request yes. for Pantera and it was blasted out was it it was so they they were playing walk-up music for all the presenters and they asked me what would I like um, and I said Pantera and I wanted the, the song walk to be played and the reaction of the BHK staff was, well, that's not heavy metal, is it? Well, I mean, yeah, it is. But um, you asked me what I wanted, so either play it or play something else. I don't mind. But to their credit, they let me have it. And so I got to walk up uh, to do my presentation on pitching and catching uh, coming out to walk by Pantera, which, is, uh, which is, is, is pretty cool. I've had two opportunities to do that. One where I, I came out to enter Sandman. Um, by Metallica, and then now I've I've walked out to to walk by by Pantera. So I'm I'm doing my best to to spread the uh, 
the gospel of metal, so to speak, in, in the world of British baseball. So if you were to create a fantasy band using baseball rules, who's the 101? You're on the clock, you get first draft pick, who are you taking? My first draft overall. Um, well, I, let me say this. I'll tell you who I'm not drafting. I'm not drafting Lars Ulrich from Metallica. And to be clear, I love Metallica. I absolutely love him, but you know, it can't be him. But I will take James Hetfield on rhythm guitar. Beautiful. Great answer. Um, and the last one is um, I don't really follow a major league baseball team. I've got the um, MLB UK community podcast trying to get me on to their show coming up soon to um, try and do like an online, uh, sorry, a live on air lottery uh, where I'll get assigned a team at random to see how that goes. I've had Kevin McAdam and Josh Chetwind tell me not to be Boston uh, Red Sox fans. Who's your team and why should I consider taking them? as my team to follow? My team are the Oakland Athletics and you should be an Oakland fan because who doesn't love an underdog? And this is a team that consistently goes up against the big fish, uh, both in terms of market size and finances. And they refuse to use that as an excuse for why they can't perform. And year in, year out, they keep finding ways um, to bring in new players, to develop new talent, and to find those those diamonds in the rough. There is a huge amount of pain involved as a as an Oakland A's fan, um, particularly when it comes around to the playoff times. But every season is a new adventure because there are so many things that change and so many wheelings and dealings that that go go on behind the scenes at Oakland um but I think it's awesome and plus who doesn't like white cleats with a white uniform there's no other team that wears that um so there you go that's my pitch Oakland A's all the way and you never know we might be talking in uh uh in not too distant future about the Oakland A's World Series champions I'll take into consideration and I'll put that down on me on my sheet of pros and, and no cons. Uh, lovely stuff. Uh, I'd like to leave the final word to the guests. So is there anything else you'd like to discuss or, or mention before we uh, part ways? Um, I think the, the two things that I'd love to say uh, is one, um, a thank you to the people that have helped me and supported me uh, along the way, you know, whether it was Liam Carroll uh, for you know his friendship over the years, and also giving me this opportunity to come in as a um, as a pitching and catching coordinator, but also thinking of coaches before me, Paul Vernon, Vince Garcia, and Tom Gillespie within the national team set up. One of my mentors, Stefan Rapaglia, Margaret Borley, who set up the Tunbridge Baseball Club, um, Craig Savage from Brighton, my mentors in Brighton and Tunbridge, Nick Carter and Alex Malahoudis, um, and then also. Uh, John Boyd, who's the current chief exec at BSUK, and Jenny Fromer, who is the former chief exec. Both of them have been uh, incredibly supportive of me and, and my journey and, and, and when I came back here after the States. Uh, and, yeah, there are there are lots of other people that I've, I've probably forgotten, you know, people like Drew Spencer at the London Mets and all my my friends and, 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 and brothers at the London Mets in particular. Um, and, of course, certainly the support of the, the, the British Baseball Federation, both Jerry Perez, who's the president, and uh, Jason Pierce, uh, who is our national team's representative. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, I could probably talk here thanking people, but it was important to me that there are so many people that have come before me and so many people that have given me this opportunity that I, I am incredibly indebted to them. And uh, for, I very much feel like I suppose I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I hope that I can continue uh, the work that they've done. Um, and then the request from the audience is let me know how I can help. Uh, there's nothing I love more than than seeing British baseball grow um, and improve. And now I'm in a position and have the opportunity to target specifically pitching and catching. Of course, I'm happy to talk about other stuff. I can you know, we can, uh, rap about you know, club development plans and, and, and marketing plans and how you raise your profile. But my, my love and my passion is pitching and catching. So if there's anything I can do, drop me an email. Hit me up on Twitter. If there's a possibility of me um running uh some coaching clinics for your coaches delivering something for your players or even just tell your players i, I run a, a private academy for pitchers and catchers at the moment the smarter performance 
Pitching and Catching Academy, um, and we've had three dates with it. We've got one more coming up, um, but we're gonna. It's been a huge success. We're gonna run more events in the future. So if you end up sending your players to that, that would be awesome too. Um, so yeah, those are probably my last requests. And and also, I thank you to you, Matt. You've been uh, an amazing host, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. And um, I hope I can come back and go on again in the future. Um, but in the meantime, I can't wait to to listen to the future episodes and future guests. So thank you. Thanks, mate. Yeah, no problem. Um, anytime you want to pop on or any news updates you want to give us, just to reach out and I'll have a chat. It's been um, been lovely talking to you. It's true what everyone said uh, about you. Uh, you have a great beard. Uh, <laughs> no, no the, everyone, everyone that I've spoken to said, like, you know, I really enjoy talking to you. You're a great, great person, lots of insight, and uh, you've not disappointed. I think the listeners will, will agree as well. So that's it for today. Uh, ne- on next week's show, um, we have your gaffer Liam Carroll on to, to talk some business as well. Inspire, um, you mentioned Inspire, Develop, Perform. I'll get fired if I don't say that. So yeah, Inspire, Develop, Perform. That's our mission statement at GB Baseball. Great stuff. Well, thanks ever so much again for your time and for, for all the advice and back and forth. Like we've, we've been tweeting for a while. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot. So take care and I'll see you soon. My pleasure. Thank you. And there you have it. What a superb guest. Thanks again to Will for his time. And I think you'll all agree some great insights and tips there. So what do you think of his number one draft pick in the fantasy band as well? Let me know on the socials using the hashtag of fantasy band. And we'll have a chat there. And you can all mock who I probably would have picked. Good thing we're not doing this in the 90s because it would have been someone daft like Fred Durst. And I'll probably get mocked for eternity. Good thing I'm not committing that to audio. Oh, no, wait. Just done it. I'm off now to tinker with my Diamond Dynasty team uh, uniform again for the 14th time in as many days on the MLB The Show. Uh, at some point I will actually get around to playing it and not just designing outfits for my uh, fantasy baseball team. So take care of yourselves and I'll see you all in the next episode. ta